I often wondered about the power of nature, its monumental energy and its colossal force exhibiting itself in natural disasters. Erupting volcanoes with its destructive streams of lava that spread for miles and its volcanic ash that smothers and destroys all forms of life remind me of the powerful presence which makes man seem inconsequential. I look at the tsunami and other upheavals in our oceans and I'm humbled by the enormity and supremacy of nature. I'm appalled as Hiroshima and Nagasaki remind me that even disasters man-made find their power sourced within nature itself. Mankind could dare split the atom with such disastrous consequences only because atoms and molecules have a benign presence around us till it is so hazardously unlocked. When I confront nature's beauty, that I begin to see the riddle that human civilization has so long tried to solve. I find meaning in my role as a student of the sciences because it is the branch of human knowledge that can unzip the mystery behind the splendor and the grass and the glory in the flower. Atoms and molecules are after all in the structure of the very elements with which our universe and we ourselves are constructed. It is omnipresent in the earth, the wind, the water, the sky and of course in fire. Particles consist of two protons and two neutrons and carry a positive electric charge. The theory was that by smashing these particles at the nucleus, they might blast it apart, converting some of the mass into energy. My observation of the endless domain of science brought me to study physics. I knew that the Shahai Institute of Nuclear Physics in Kolkata was a premier center of learning, so I wrote to its director. I was accepted and my excitement brought me to the Shahai Institute a day before my course began. India's first center for nuclear physics. It was established by the great Indian pathfinder Meghnath Shaha. A visionary, he paved the way for so many much greater than me. I was lucky to have a chance meeting with the director himself. Welcome to Shaha Institute of Nuclear Physics. Uh, Please give it to the Avashan security. Okay, sir. Sampurna, I understand your class starts tomorrow. Yes, sir, but I couldn't assist myself. 
So, could I look around and see the premises? Of course, you are part of this institute. You, can, you are free to visit any laboratory you like. Thank you, sir. I have seen your uh, CV. It's very impressive. Thank you. Uh, but you should also know the history of this institute. Uh, you know, the, Professor Meghnath Saha is a celebrated physicist, well known throughout the world. And uh, you know, he started this institute along with the post MSc course where you are joining now for uh, doing your PhD work. This is before 60 years. In fact, he was the first person who started nuclear physics in a MSc course in a university in India. That's the Calcutta University. This is even before the nuclear fission was discovered. Fission was discovered in 1939. He initiated this course in University of Calcutta Physics Department in 1938. When he was a student in Germany, Meghnath Shah's letter to his father in 1921 clearly indicates his early involvement with nuclear physics and the future of the knowledge domain in India. Soon after India won freedom, the foundation stone of the institute was laid by Dr. Shama Prashad Mukherjee, Union Industry Minister, on the 21st of April 1948. By 1950, the 30,000 square feet, three-storied building was completed. Built for 6.7 lakhs, a further 1.2 lakhs from the Atomic Energy Commission. Madame Curie was invited to the inauguration ceremony by a letter dated the 17th of December 1949. On the 11th of January 1950, the Institute of Nuclear Physics was inaugurated by Madame Irene Joliot Curie in the august presence of Professor F. Joliot Curie, Sir Robert and Lady Gertrude Robinson, Professor J. D. Bernal, and many distinguished Indian scientists. The primary target was to build India's first cyclotron and to inaugurate research in nuclear energy. With Jawaharlal Nehru's assistance and Dorabji Tata's patronage, funds were available for building the machine. By mid-1950, the reconstruction of the cyclotron was completed and ready for operation, but there were snags that remained. Meghnath Shah passed away on the 16th of February 1956. After that, it was renamed the Shah Institute of Nuclear Physics. 1964 brought a third building for the Biophysics Division on land donated by the West Bengal government. With further developments, the time for laying the foundation stone for the Phase 1 building came on the 12th of March 1977. Dr. Homi Setna of the Atomic Energy Commission graced the occasion. Completed on a Department of Atomic Energy grant of 88 lakh rupees in 1979, the building had a covered area of 75,380 square feet in four floors. Over the years, the Shah Institute of Nuclear Physics today has diversified into different branches of science, classified into five subjects. The first one is condensed matter physics including surface physics and nanoscience. The biophysical sciences that include chemistry is the second. Thirdly, theoretical physics including mathematics. The fourth is experimental nuclear and particle physics. The fifth is concerned with plasma physics with electronics. Specialized centers include facilities for research in experimental nuclear and astrophysics or FRENA, the Center for Nanoscience and Surface Physics or CENSA, the Center for Applied Mathematics and Computational Science or CAMCS, and the Center for Astroparticle Physics or CAP. Now, a lot of activities, research activities, is being done in nanoscience, and a lot of new technology is being developed on uh, using nanoscience. What is nanoscience? Nanoscience is uh, actually uh, the research using material whose size is one nanometer. That means uh, something like 10 atoms uh, together. Now, in that nanoscience or in nanometer region, what happens is uh, the property of a material changes as you change its shape, size and anything. 
Now, obviously, when you come to the nanometer region, then most of the atoms are on the surface because there are very few atoms around. And uh, then you must understand how the atoms are organized and how they are uh, together. So, here in this laboratory, we have two facilities basically to understand the atomic arrangement at the surface. So, one is this facility, this is a rotating anode x ray generator facility. This we set up long back and it is still working very nicely. Uh, here, what we do, we put a sample and irradiate that sample with very intense x ray, uh, is a monochromatic x ray and generated in this rotating anode and then the x-ray gets reflected from the surface of the sample and we study the intensity as a function of incident angle. From there, we can figure out how the atoms are organized on the surface of the material. Same sample then we take out and put in the other machines you can see there. This is the atomic force microscopy and scanning tunneling microscopy machine. So, same sample is put there and it is like a record player, I do not know whether you people have seen in our childhood, the record player is a pin which moves on a record. Here same thing happens, there is a pin which moves on sample, but the movement is in micrometer or nanometer. So, you get an image from the movement of the sample. So, you have two information, one from x-ray, another from AFM, STM. Using these two information, we get detailed information about the surface of a material. This is extremely important, especially for nanoscience research. This has really created revolution. Is the property of the material changes means gold, for example. Uh, if you go to nano size, it may not remain uh, metal. So, it may become magnetic. So, this kind of things happens. So, you can devise lot of technological thing using same material by just simply playing with its shape and size. And so, X-ray scattering technique and the atomic force microscopy technique are very important to understand the shape and size of the material, how they are organized. And as the nanotechnology develops, we will get a miracle in our even daily life. For example, the computer we use now will become smaller and smaller. That means the mobile phone may replace the computer. That is the kind of thing people are, I mean this will happen soon. But there are many more things which will happen in future, like in nano medicine and in nano uh, technology and many fields will get affected. This is a research subject where biology, physics and chemistry coming together and in our institute all these subjects are studied, so we are taking a big initiative in India in this subject. Okay, ma'am, what is laser actually? See, this is NDR laser, that's what we use, fine? Yeah. And if we speak it in a very simplified way, then it's a light which is highly monochromatic in nature, it's unidirectional. And for this setup, the pulse width of this light is of the order of nanoseconds. Laser flash photolysis helps to identify the transients formed during the interactions between different chemical and biological molecules. The pump probe technique uses different harmonics of ND YAG laser with 8 to 10 NS pulse width to pump the molecules probed by pulsed Z lamp. opened out before me at the library of the Shah Institute. The interrelatedness of different branches of science makes fresh demands on students like me to discover for myself other relevant domains of knowledge. The process of synthesis and assimilation is an intriguing and ongoing process and I'm grateful for the opportunity I have found here. Books and journals lead me to look for other sources of information available not just in the ambience of the library alone, but also far beyond. 
unknown doors of perception open up for me here as I reach out towards horizons I did not know existed. So what will happen is that these persons will be after the trade, they will have different money when before they came, before the trade and after the trade. But New horizons are being discovered and nurtured at the Shah Institute beyond nuclear physics. One of the new disciplines is econophysics that works on the interrelation between economics and physics. The application of physics in the study of economics at the money markets, the stock exchange and elsewhere has emerged. Or atoms, we have the agents in, the, in that activity. The 11th five-year plan project has contributed the Cray XT5 supercomputer to study the frontiers of theoretical physics. Its efficient, massively parallel computing environment is suitable for highly demanding computational problems like lattice gauge theory, a method that calculates non-perturbative properties in quantum field theories. In operation since early 2010, the XT5 has a two-cabinet configuration comprising of 172 compute nodes, each node having two quad-core processors providing 1,376 compute cores in total. This laboratory is equipped with inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer, which can measure ultra-trace amount of any element down to parts per trillion level. This finds applications in many branches of science, from environmental to medical sciences. The Large Hydron Collider in CERN, Geneva, has scientists from the Shah Institute of Nuclear Physics actively involved in international collaboration. Work on the search for dark matter candidates has also been initiated in collaboration with the Picasso experiment stationed at the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory or SNOW Lab in Canada. Scientists of the Shah Institute of Nuclear Physics have been an active partner in the design and fabrication of large numbers of detectors in the Indian National Gamma Array Project, or INGA. Research in nuclear physics also covers a broad range of nuclear structure and reaction studies spanning a very rich nuclear landscape of stable and unstable nuclei. It is the plethora of unstable nuclei going towards either the proton or the neutron drip lines that have become accessible with the advent of state-of-the-art particle accelerators. My life at the Institute engages my mind and my attention constantly. But of course, that does not mean all work and no play. The presence of lively minds among my fellow students makes living here a totally different experience. Our involvement in academics does not preclude the joy of living that one would associate with being young. The energy and vitality that flows from our youthful enthusiasm towards life creates a unique ambience which inspires us constantly. Inspiration at the Shaha Institute extends even to the well-equipped workshop where students are expected to participate in projects headed by leading members of the illustrious faculty. Learning from the atmosphere and from the example of respected members of the scientific community is part of the opportunity created at the Institute. The wide array of equipment and the variety of ongoing projects offer a significant gamut of learning opportunities. An invitation from a friend to a lecture at the auditorium can open new windows into the world of science. Of course, I'm excited by the presence of famous scientists in our faculty, many of them involved in path-breaking research. But even more thrilling is the encounter with leading scientists, not only from different parts of India, but from all over the globe. My friend's invitation turned out to a thrilling experience to listen to the lecture of Professor C.N.R. Rao, the world-renowned material scientist and the former director of Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He is now the president of the Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research. It was more than an honor to be present in the same auditorium with him.
Next door at the auditorium complex is the Science Gallery, a permanent exhibition into many areas of science and scientific research. I found it inspirational to be acquainted with the legends of science and their work. Life at the Institute offered another dimension in the hostile ambience shared by so many bright and lively students. I realized early enough that the exacting demands of a scientific career would drive us to our books even in the few hours of leisure to prepare ourselves for the next day. Because each new day is a challenge in itself. If you study this, uh, uh, both condensation, <coughs> in this formalism, the physical processes become even more uh, transparent. So uh, it is, uh, we will see that uh, today we are going to apply it for the metallic system and then subsequently we will discuss Bose-Einstein condensation. This gives you a very nice formalism to understand <coughs> this Bose condensation phenomena or uh, for, uh, superconductivity for instance. You have k square by twice m u k x, then you have a very nice and compact expression for this matrix element which is k prime t k equals to k square by twice m delta k prime k. Yes. Um, so what are the spectra indicating? Um, I think these are the your drug molecule to interact with the protein. Okay, and how do you make it out? Uh, look, uh, this top spectra, this is for yeah. your protein. It okay. gets quenched in presence of your drug. See, this lower one, okay. continuously. And it flows like this? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Shalanda. I was excited on my way to the photo emission spectroscopy laboratory. The ARPES laboratory provides state of the art facilities with angle resolved photo emission spectrometer acquired recently by the institute. It performs surface electronic structure characterization of crystalline materials, elucidating the relation between the electronic, magnetic and chemical structure of solid surfaces. Another laboratory houses the experimental setup used to characterize the magnetic materials at very low temperature with the application of a magnetic field low enough to be comparable to that of the earth. I think you are wondering about the machine which is a very complex type of equipment which is known as secondary ion mass spectrometer or the SIMS. We are measuring actually the interface chemistry, we know how the interface look like. When we grow the nanostructure or the multiple quantum structures, we have to know precisely how the interface composition look like. Because interface chemistry is very crucial to understand the behavior of the multilayered structures because very, it has a big importance for many applications, it has many applications basically. This is the cesium ion gun. We can use this one too for detecting the negative ion productions. This is basically oxygen for detecting positive ions and this is for the negative ions. So we have to select which one we need depending on the materials basically. So this is basically the, about the equipment. The whole machine is computerized, computer controlled. So we can really see, we can probe by computer uh, the energy of the ions, their intensities and the, 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 the you know, we can even the probe the surface by rastering the ions, so we exactly uh, we can raster and we can detect the secondary ions also as a function of time. The liquid helium plant and the liquid nitrogen plant are included in one of the oldest cryogenic facilities in the country, where inert gases like nitrogen and more recently helium is liquefied. This is one of the earliest nuclear magnetic resonance laboratories in the country. 
my exposure to interdisciplinary scientific inquiry has led me to many laboratories inside Shah Institute of Nuclear Physics, like the Molecular Biology Laboratory. So how is the column now, uh, doing now? Subtle disturbances in the activities of the normal molecular players that can transform them into veritable rogues are studied at the laboratory. The rogues are manifested in severely debilitating hematological disorders like thalassemia, sickle cell anemia, leukemia, or neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Prion, Parkinson's, or Huntington's. The resources utilized here provide a balanced platform for implementing cutting-edge technology, while also utilizing classical methods to address some of the fundamental issues in protein chemistry and cell biology, while various affinity columns address a problem biochemically on one hand, on the other, Latest advances in mass spectrometry help identify interacting molecular partners. Functional significance of such interactions are addressed by high-resolution imaging of cultured human cells as they happen and also by using genetically modified animal models. The state-of-the-art flow cytometric facility helps identify why and how a cell really goes on the wrong path and ultimately results in these fatal diseases. So basically what we have, we have the crystal over here. We take the crystal from the drop, put it in the X-ray beam, and here we pull, we pull down the crystal. So when the crystal diffracts, we collect the data, and this is the um, image plate, which records all the diffracted spot. So these spots, uh, all the information in the spots are transferred into that computer over here. If you see, this is the computer and, and you see these are the diffraction spots. So what we do, we collect a whole data set, we process the data and from the process data, what you can do, we can solve the structures. The tools of modern biology enable the visualization of the interior of a protein molecule. Despite its huge size, X-rays are used to look into the atomic ambience, the diffracted rays are collected in an image plate and the molecule image is reconstructed on the computer. These protein structures also help to design drugs to combat diseases better. The first Indian electron microscope was fabricated and built at the Shaha Institute of Nuclear Physics during its early years. The transmission electron microscope is the most powerful tool and is used to characterize nano-sized materials and large biomolecular assembly Plasma, the fourth state of matter, has immense potential for applications. The major application is to generate energy through nuclear fusion in a tokamak. Tokamak is a Russian acronym for toroidal confinement by magnetic fields. The Shah Institute of Nuclear Physics has an efficient administrative system, spearheaded by the registrar's office and the accounts department, to name a few, that supports the academic ambience of the institute. The medical unit is always on the alert to provide support to students and employees. Meghnath Shah's pioneering work on thermal ionization opened up several new frontiers of astrophysics. Today the institute has a new optical telescope housed inside an observatory dome. It opens up a new window to the fascinating universe for students and researchers. Named after Meghnath Shah, the observatory is a humble tribute to the founder of this institute on the occasion of the Diamond Jubilee year of the institute that bears his name and carries on his life's work. Nature has come to mean much more to me than it did before. Its power, synonymous with its glory, its potential for service to mankind, more important than its potential for destruction. I have come face to face with the ethics that must govern science and all scientific activity.